Okay, uh, could I please request somebody to lead us in prayer so that we could pray and get started? Anyone could lead us in prayer. Okay. Um, Simran, Simran, pray. Simran, pray. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think Shaya, you wanted to pray. Go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful joy of your learning your word, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for each and every time you, you are teaching us new things to walk align with you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Father. Father God, as we are starting this new lesson, Lord God, Father, open our minds, our ears, Lord Jesus, Father. Give us good understanding, O Lord Jesus, Father, and anoint all of us with your spirit, O Lord Jesus, Father, so we will be able to practice every day in our life, O Lord. Bless Pastor and bless each one of us, O Lord Jesus, Father. So whatever Pastor will teach us, we will be understand very well and it will be easy for us to follow and walk aligned with you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Bless each one of us. I, I give all our wonderful time in your hand, O oh Lord Jesus, Father. Help us, lead us, and guide us. In Jesus' sweet, precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for connecting to this course on holiness. Um, we are in our last section where we are talking about overcoming how we practically overcome. And in talking about this uh, overcome sin and so on, in talking about this, we are highlighting two important sources that God has given to us. One is his word, and second, the work of his Holy Spirit. God, Holy Spirit, is there to help us. And so we... We're talking about walking in the Spirit because God has said in the New Testament, He said, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So He's given that as our answer. Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So our flesh, which is our natural body, has, uh, it can have good desires, I can have bad desires. You know, it has normal desires, which you, know, you sleep, you rest, you, all of those things, you eat, and all those things are there. Those are normal desires. But then it can have bad desires. And we saw in Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. That is the sinful flesh. And God has said, you walk in the Spirit, you be led by the Spirit, you live in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So God has given us, He's given every believer the means how to overcome the flesh, whatever the flesh is, whatever the deeds of the flesh, you know whether it's jealousy, hatred, anger, or any other sinful, anything else, everything else, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the Holy Spirit helps us put to death the deeds of our body. So we've read these parallel passages, uh, Romans chapter 8, Galatians uh, chapter 5, and Ephesians chapter 5. We read it last week, and I'm not taking the time to read those passages again, but it's those passages we are delving in. He said, the Holy Spirit helps us mortify, put to death the deeds of our body. So Romans, the 8th chapter, the 13th verse, uh, the Apostle Paul said, and if you walk after the flesh, you will die. 
But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. If you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of your body, the sinful deeds of the body, you will live. Or Galatians 5 and verse 24 again, we saw this last week. I'm just quickly reviewing. Galatians 5, 24, which, the, which we saw, Paul wrote, he said, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and desires. So, the flesh, it has its affections and desires. Sometimes these affections and desires are ungodly. They're not, they're not holy because the flesh desires against the spirit and the spirit desires against the flesh. These are opposite. But they who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and desires. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we put an end to these things. And we said last week, one of the ways in which we do this, one of the main ways is through prayer. Is through prayer. Because Romans, the eighth chapter, again, going back to that same chapter, Romans chapter eight, in verse 26 and 27, Romans 8, 26, 27, the apostle Paul wrote, he said, the spirit himself helps us in our weaknesses. So, yeah. There are weaknesses, things that we are not, we face. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So what we said is, the Spirit helps us, to help means together with us not independent of us, but together with us, he helps us. It's not like I don't do anything and Holy Spirit will fight the battle for me. No, he helps me. So I have to fight, but he helps me. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. How? We don't know what to pray for. So when we are faced with our weakness, we don't know how, how to pray for this. How do I pray? What am I supposed to pray? We don't know. But that's where he helps make intercession. So the intercession is not independent of us, but it's with us because that's the original subject of the verse. He helps us. How? By helping us make intercession, praying with us, helping us pray with groanings which cannot be uttered. So that means it's these expressions that come, not from an intellectual thing that which I can utter on my own. No, it's what comes from the Holy Spirit. So we were talking how important prayer is. As part of this process of crucifying the flesh with its affections and desires. So prayer is key to asking the Holy Spirit to help us overcome our weaknesses. And what we said last week was, sometimes a prayer is a very simple prayer, very easy prayer. The Holy Spirit, uh, I'm feeling this, please help me. Okay, you know, work is done. Holy Spirit comes, helps you overcome. But sometimes the, the prayer is much longer, right? We have to pray, we have to engage in prayer for hours, for days, for a season in our life till we overcome. So it's not a set formula. I cannot say you pray for one minute, it'll <laughs> your, your weakness will go away. I cannot say that. All we can say is Holy Spirit will help us as we pray to overcome our weaknesses. So that's the first thing. Second thing that we started talking about was being filled with the Spirit. 
This is from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. So uh, based on the context and based on the picture that uh, Apostle Paul is using, he's talking about uh, somebody who is drunk with the wine uh, and he's, uh, you know, he's just using that as an illustration, as a picture of somebody who's filled with the Spirit. So our focus must be on the good side, but we get some idea from the example. He says, you know, don't be drunk with one, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, uh, you know, a person who's drunk, uh, he's controlled by the wrong thing. But we must be under the influence of the right thing, right? Which is, in, we must be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's... So, to walk overcoming the flesh, we must walk in the Spirit. We must be filled with the Spirit all the time. We must live in the Spirit, that is living filled with the Spirit. So we want to understand that. How can I tell? that I'm actually filled with the Spirit. You know, I'm living in the Spirit. Paul gives us in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21, he gives us the expressions of a person who is walking filled with the Spirit. Just like when a person is drunk, intoxicated, there are certain things you look at and you can tell that person is drunk. Right? He may not be steady in his walk. He'd be uttering all the wrong things and whatever. You know, you see and you can tell that person is drunk. In like manner, you see a believer and you can tell this believer is walking in the spirit or he is walking filled with the spirit. How can you tell? Well, he gives us that in verses 19 to 21 of Ephesians 5. So that's what we want to look at today. How could you tell? How could we tell that, that you know, how can I tell I'm, I'm, I'm actually walking in the Spirit? I'm walking filled with the Spirit. I'm walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That means my Spirit is under His influence, under His leadership. Um, this is the life, Spirit-filled life, which will help me overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. So he says, verse 19 of Ephesians 5, uh, we read this passage last week, so I'm just continuing with that. He says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So first, there is this song, there's, the song to the Lord. You're always uh, uh, singing. You know, I will uh, be in this place of where I am singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord. And I'm speaking, edify edifying to one another. So first one, speaking to one another. I mean, the way I'm speaking. In Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Right now, obviously, I can't be singing to you and me. It's not that's the it's not the point. But the point is, I'm speaking words that are under inspiration. I'm speaking things that are edifying. So psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and speaking to one another are meant for edifying, encouraging, and inspiring one another. So speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Secondly, in that same verse 19, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That means your heart is in a constant place of communion with God. Now, it doesn't mean you have to sing like a, you know, like a, a professional who, or somebody who's very good in singing, that's not the point. The point is my heart is always worshiping, thanking God. So verse 19 has two parts to it. One is to one another, and one is to the Lord. So if I'm walking in the Spirit, if I'm filled with the Spirit, 
it affects how I commune with others, communicate with others, and how I communicate with God. So when I'm communicating with us, I'm bringing forth things that are edifying, encouraging, inspiring. And when I'm speaking and I'm in communion with God, I am singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord. And I'm, 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 I'm this heart of worship. And then it continues in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm always thankful to God. This is a, a, a place of thankfulness to God. Place of thankfulness to God. Third, third thing, always thanking God for everything. That means God, thank you. You find things to be thankful for. There's a heart of thanksgiving all the time to God. And verse 21, fourth thing, you're walking in, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You're walking in humility and submission and reverence to God. So verses 19, 20, 21, two times he talks about to God or to the Lord, two times. He talks about to one another. To one another, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for God. So walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, it is expressed in how I relate to other people, how I speak to one another, and how I submit to one another. In these four verses, he also talks about to the Lord and to God. Verse 19, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God. So singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God. So think about this. How can you tell you're filled with the Holy Spirit? How can you tell you're walking in the Spirit? How can you tell you are Spirit-filled? He gives us four checkpoints. Two has to do with one another. Two has to do with to God. To one another, what does he say? Speak to one another, submit to one another. To God, he says, sing and make melody, give thanks always. Very simple, isn't it? Can't get confused. These are the characteristics of somebody who is drunk in the spirit. These are the characteristics of somebody who is filled with the spirit. Have you speak to one another? Have you submit to one another? How do you sing and make melody in your heart to God? And how do you, you're always thankful to God in everything? Four characteristics here, he says, of somebody who's filled with the Spirit. And surely, if you and I are filled with the Spirit or drunk with the Spirit and are doing these four things, the fifth will be very obvious, which is the fruit of the Spirit will be manifested. That is Galatians chapter 5, right? And when you're walking in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will come. Love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These things will just fill our lives. And that is the spirit-filled life. 
And that's the kind of life that overcomes the flesh, the world, and the devil. Everyone's together, everyone understands this. So, if somebody asks us, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What would we say? Would we say, you have to speak in tongues? Well, speaking in tongues is good, is important. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. You know, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're also filled with the Spirit. And of course, you speak in tongues. And speaking in tongues is one way through which we sing and make melody in our, in our hearts to the Lord and through which we're able to commune with God. So it is part of that spiritual life. Because when he says, you know, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord, you can do that in tongues. And just sing in tongues and make melody in your heart to the Lord. You can give thanks. But we cannot isolate it and say it has to do with speaking in tongues alone. That's a wrong idea of being filled with the Spirit. The four characteristics are given here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. These are the four. And the fifth one is from Galatians chapter 5. It has to do with how we relate to people and commune with God and what is expressed through our lives, right? And uh, I see Debbie's comment, it's ongoing communion with the Lord and the flowing of that to people around us. That's right. So this is how we can tell that I'm walking in the spirit, that I'm filled with the spirit. So the moment, the moment. So let, let me, let's let's make this practical. So in our daily lives, try to maintain this. Try to keep this singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord something spontaneous, right? Now, I'm not a singer, personally. I can't sing like, you know, the, the worship leaders and all that. But when I'm by myself, I can sing a song to the Lord. Meaning, I, I'm not worried about the tune. I, I can't carry a tune. I'm not worried about, you know, whether this is perfect song. Because it's not about anybody else listening to me. It's about me singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord. Right, so I can do that. It could be a song that I know, it could be just some words I want to sing, or I could even just sing in tongues. Secondly, I can practice giving thanks always to God. God, I am thankful. God, I am thankful. That means you're recognizing things to be thankful about. Life is not, you know, things around us is not going to be perfect. But in the midst of all of that, we still find things to be thankful for. But that's an expression of you being filled with the Holy Spirit. You do it intentionally. And then when we're relating to people, uh, you always try to do this, to speak things that are edifying. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. I mean, of course, you're not singing to them, but you are doing things to edify. You're doing things to inspire. You're doing things to bless. And submit to one another. So that means you're not here to uh, force people, to dominate people, to control people. That's not it. You're walking in humility before people out of reverence for God. Now, if, if you're in leadership, like for example, me, you know, I'm leadership, so I need to lead the people, uh, you know, the whole team of people who are working here in church, uh, as well as um, the congregation, so on. And so sometimes I may have to have some 
very difficult conversations with people. You know, if somebody's not doing their work, I don't keep quiet and just pretend everything is okay or, you know, no, I just have to ask them, hey, are you doing your work? Uh, what's going on? Or if the work is not up to the mark, I have to tell them, you know, uh, this, this is not good. Uh, this has to be done differently. So those are tough conversations to have. Right? So I'm speaking, but it may not be very edifying in the sense they won't feel happy. But the thing is, I can't close my eyes and pretend that uh, things are okay when it's not okay. So I have to address it, but I do it out of a sincere heart. I do it out of reverence for God because God has put us in stewards of the, as stewards of these things, right? Uh, so I'm doing it out of reverence for God because God is going to ask me, God is going to ask that person, what did you do with what we've given you? Right? So I have to do it out of reverence for God. And at the same time, I do it not to destroy the person, but for the common good, for the glory of God and for the benefit of people. So I hold people accountable. I have to, you know, sometimes you're going to have tough conversations and you're going to say, look, what's happening, all of that. But everything is done how? Submit to one another. I'm doing it out of humility, with reverence for God, and with the intent to help that person become better so that the output can be better. And when the output is better, people are going to be served well. So that's the motivation. And you can even do difficult things, but under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is how we can tell. Now, the second part of it is, if we get out of this place of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what we do, we should immediately recognize. You know, the way I spoke to that person was not edifying. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. That was not edifying. I'm, I, I repent and I apologize to the person. Then I bring myself back in submission to the Holy Spirit. Or, Lord, uh, you know, I, I, I may not be, you know, be you know, in that place where I'm singing and making melody in my heart. Will bring yourself back. Start singing to the Lord. Be, you know, be in that place where you're giving glory to God. Or, uh, if you know, if you know, if you feel like okay, I, I, I haven't been thankful to the, come back. Let's be thankful to the Lord. You know, so everything. So you're constantly watching over yourself and you're bringing yourself back into this place of being in submission to God, you know, being in that place where you're walking in the spirit. Okay. All right. So do you have a question? Let's take it. You have questions, so is it? Go ahead. Mm. Okay, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a mistake. Uh, so, is it, do you have a question? All right, maybe he'll come later. I don't know. Okay, so anybody else uh, have any questions so far? You're all you're all with me, so. Good. Any doubts? All right. So now we are going to. So, do you have a question? Okay. Fine. So we've we've covered these two important aspects. One is, you know using the word of God, walking in the spirit. These are two important things in overcoming the flesh, the world, the devil. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get into each one of these three things. It means the flesh, you want to understand some details, right? How does the flesh, how does it 
you know, work and uh, so that we can deal with things of the flesh. Then the world, how does the world pull on us? And then the devil, how does he, you know, do his work in trying to pulling us down? And then the answer is always the same. You've got to use the word of God. We've got to walk in the spirit to overcome the flesh. You've got to use the word of God, walk in the spirit to overcome the world. We have to use the word of God, walk in the spirit to overcome the devil. So the answer is the same, but we want to talk about, you know, how to practically do this. Okay. So we're going into the next chapter. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. All right, so this is chapter five, overcoming the flesh. Now, what must we understand? We must understand how temptations come through the flesh. Okay? So for that, one of the best passages to go to is James chapter one, verses 13 to 16. So could somebody read this? For us, please. James 1, 13 to 16, please. James chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Mm. Amen. So, think about this. What James is saying is, when somebody is tempted, of course, here the word tempt or temptation has to do with inducement to sin, right? To do something wrong uh, that is evil, so sinful, not, not pleasing to God. So he says, look, when you are facing temptation, don't say God is tempting me. It is not God who is saying, I'm giving you this opportunity to do this wrong thing. No, no, that's deception, right? So if the uh, if uh, somebody thinks that God is giving me the opportunity to do this evil thing, that is what? That is deception. So he says, do not be deceived. Right? Now, you know, you will hear some people, I'm talking about believers, who will say, you oh, know, God gave me the opportunity to do this and this, or they will look at temptation as a God-given thing. Uh, and uh, that is really just a deception, self-deception, right? So James is making it very clear. Look, if there's some inducement to sin, to do something wrong, don't even think God is behind it. Don't even let that cross your mind. Because God cannot be tempted by evil and God himself does not tempt anybody to do evil. That, that must be absolutely clear. Because there are so many people, even believers, who think like this. And it's such a, it's such a warped way to think. Such a warped way to think. But James is you know, addressing it. He's making it clear. Because obviously, this needs to be stated. And uh, you know, some believers think like this. You know? So we must get rid of that kind of thinking. Whatever area, whatever area, don't allow the devil to deceive you or don't deceive yourself by thinking that some opportunity to do something evil is God-given. No. So, example. If it has to do with money, right? Let's say you have a need financially. Let's say you, you have a need for example, 100,000 rupees. 
And there's opportunity before you where somebody, you know, you can get that 100,000 rupees, but the way it is coming is wrong. It is dishonest. It may be coming, you know, in, 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 in some guise of godliness. Never try to justify it by saying, God is providing. No. If it is a dishonest, if it is an unethical means, God is not in it. Simple. But you say, well, I have a need for 100,000. 100,000 exactly is coming. Still, it's not God. So this is sometimes, you know, where we, we tend to go wrong. But this is where we get deceived. Either we deceive ourselves or the devil deceives us. You know, I, I remember a long time ago, um, this was many years ago, I think it was back in 2008 here in Bangalore. And again, uh, please excuse me if I repeat some stories. Uh, I, I don't know which, which class I said, which story. So, um, so you know, we were here in Bangalore. Uh, there was a time when a lot of us churches got together. I think it was about 30, 35 churches got together to do certain things to help churches in, 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 our, in our state. And uh, so we had formed an, a common entity and organization and different churches were supposed to contribute, you know, money to it. That money will be used for certain things. So at some stage, maybe the next year, the year after, you know, uh, the work actually, the work that, that was being done by the organization actually came down. But at one point, we as a church, we had all people's church, we had contributed 100,000 rupees to, towards this common uh, organization entity and uh, that amount was not used so similarly other churches may have contributed some amounts whatever but then because you know that money was not used the the pastor in charge and the people in charge they said okay we're going to return the money because it was not used so i remember the man from that organization was working he called me he said you know all People's Church has uh, contributed 100,000 and uh, we are going to return the 100,000. I said, yeah. And his next question really shocked me. His next question was, do you want the check in your name? I was actually shocked. It's like, that is a question that should not even be asked. You know why? Because that money didn't come from my personal account. It came from the church. The church contributed 100000 to the common entity. And therefore, if the money is going to be returned, there is no question to whom it should be returned. It should be returned to the church. And for that man to even ask me, and, you know, do you want the check in your name? It's like, whoa. You know, for me, it was like, first of all, the answer was very simple. No, the money came from the church. It should be in the name of the church. But it shocked me because what if others were taking the money back in their name? You know, meaning other pastors. And I don't know. That would be just wrong to do that. Right? Now, I didn't go and check and see, you know, because I wasn't responsible for the accounts and so on. But in my case, in this particular case, I just said, yeah, it has to go back to the church. Please put the check in the name of the church. No more questions. But I'm just giving that as an example where if there was a pastor who had a personal need for 100,000, he could have said, wow, this is God providing me. 100,000. Or the devil could have convinced him, hey, see how God worked it out for you? 
100,000 is coming to you. But actually, it is wrong. Why? Because God does not lead anybody to do evil. Right? God doesn't do that. So, you have to be very clear. But how does temptation come? So James explains this. He says, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So his own desires. So, you know, when we feel temptation, first thing is understand, it has to do with my own desires. So the, where I need to fight the battle is with my own desires. Now, the devil, of course, may do things to stir up my own desire. So the devil can do that. He can, you know, uh, put wrong thoughts, ideas, imaginations, or he can, there could be things of the world that are pulling on my desires. But where is the battle? The battle is with my own desires. They can be outside source that stir up my desires. It could be something in the world or it could be something the devil is doing. But the battle is with my own desires. That's why each one is tempted by his own desires and enticed. Enticed means trapped or drawn into a trap. And then when we give in to that desire, then that is when sin happens. So think about this. To have wrong desires is not sin. It means you're facing the pressure of your wrong desire. That itself is not sin. But giving in to the wrong desire, that is sin. The wrong desire, we'll all face it because we're still in the flesh. We're still living in this body. And there are, we are living in this world. The world has all its advertising going on and it will try to, you know, play on our desires. Or the devil is around. He will try to stir up these desires. So feeling your own wrong desires is, is not sin yet. Giving in to the wrong desire results in sin. And if continue in sin, that it just controls us, it's fully grown, it will result in death. It will bring forth something that's very destructive in our lives. So, we're going to stop here. The point is this. Temptation happens when our own desires are stirred up. And so this is the real battle. The battle is with our own desires. That's why I remember Galatians 5.24. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and desires. This is what they have dealt with. They have crucified affections and desires. We'll continue this on Wednesday. Any questions so far? Okay. Talking about wrong desires. Uh, so Beth asked a question, what come wrong desires? Doesn't Jesus say that those who harbor wrong feelings is as good as doing the sin? Okay. So we, we need to differentiate between feeling the wrong desire and fantasizing or feeding the wrong desire. These are two different things. So example, okay, you know, I'm just using example for men, all right. You know, you're walking down the street or wherever and you see a beautiful lady and you say, wow, that's a, you know, she's beautiful, she's good looking. And you recognize that person's good looking, whatever. And you appreciate, you pause there. 
you haven't sinned, you haven't done anything wrong, right? You may even feel attracted to that person in the sense you're attracted to the good looks. Wow, you feel attracted, you haven't sinned. Why? It's your body responding, your natural responding, you're recognizing somebody is good, you feel attracted, you haven't sinned. But if you feed that attraction and you let it become something else, okay, uh, you know, if it goes into lusting after that person or fantasizing of that person, uh, you know, those kind of, so you're feeding into that, that's when it becomes sin. So you can state it like this. Wrong, wrong thoughts coming into your mind is not sin. But thinking wrong is sin. Having evil thoughts come to your mind, that moment when the devil is trying to strike something, that's not sin, you haven't sinned. But if you accept that thought and you start thinking on it, engaging in it willfully, that's when you sin. So we have to differentiate between feeling wrong desire and feeding a wrong desire. I hope I explained that. Uh, okay, next one. When we pray for somebody and we don't know what to pray and we ask Holy Spirit to lead us, sometimes we don't speak anything, but there will be groaning and we feel sad and we cry. Is it the work of the Holy Spirit in us or is it our sad emotion? How will we understand? Okay, so uh, let, let's let's put it like this. So Chaya says, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're praying for somebody, uh, you may not, say anything but you feel the emotion you you know you feel sad you cry and you know so on uh, is that the holy spirit or is it just the emotion well let me let's say let's respond to that this way first of all give in to that feeling right because we are people created with emotion and our emotions you know are a way for us to express. So you feel sad for somebody and you want you feel crying with that person, you grieve with that person, give in to it, don't hold back, right? It's you expressing compassion um, uh, and uh, support and uh, you know togetherness with that person through what they're going through. So give in to it. Don't worry, oh, is this the Holy Spirit or not? God gave us emotions and it's part of who we are and let it let it flow, let it flow. Let it just, you know, express compassion, support. Just Now, there will be times when the Holy Spirit is flowing through that emotion. There will be times. And so, that expression of emotion becomes a conduit or a channel of the Holy Spirit's work into that person's life. So just as we can, you know, express laughter and joy, sometimes we can express tears and grief and crying, and that becomes a channel to minister to that person. And I'll just share this you know, it, it has happened to me at times. Uh, and I remember once um, a friend of mine, he was a, a junior to me in school and college. And uh, he settled abroad somewhere and he came and met me. And he was one of, you know, when I was in college, he was one of our worship leaders. So we had a very, you know, and we used to spend time you know, being very close in the ministry. And uh, uh, when I was in the US, you know, we stayed together for some period of time. And of course, then, you know, we went our different ways and so on. So there was that closeness that we had in times past. And now, of course, it's many years have gone. But he had 
he came to Bangalore to visit and uh, uh, and then he shared with me a very difficult phase of his life that he'd been through and uh, so you know I was just sitting listening to him uh, his marriage had broken and all those things a lot of pain and all of that and so after he finished sharing uh, I said okay let's pray together you know I, I didn't say anything because I, I, I couldn't say it. it was so shocking you know I mean we grew up together he's just a few years younger to me you know we've journeyed through so many years together in college in school and college and and to see this happen to my own you know somebody very close to me is, is so so uh, heartbreaking and so after we finished sharing, I, I said, let's pray together. We stood up. I put my hand around him. And from that moment, I just started crying. And it wasn't just, it, it was like crying from that very depth. It was, it was embarrassing because it was not like a small, it, it was deep weeping. And, I, and we are sitting in the living room. His mother is there. And his mother came out to see what was happening two elderly grown men standing and one grown man crying like you know it was it was a deep loud thing and, and i couldn't control it was overwhelming now and it went on for quite a few minutes and if you ask me was it your emotion or was it the holy spirit i don't know uh, maybe it was the holy spirit i don't know but I just couldn't control. And I didn't pray. I didn't say any words. But it just went on for several minutes. And then when I felt that, you know, that, that, that whole burden lift, it was more like a few words saying, Amen, that's it. But I felt that's all. That, 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 that's all that happens. You know, so like that, that kind of experience has happened a few times, maybe, I would say, maybe four times. Uh, uh, yeah, that's all, four times. It, that, that deep, when, when I was in, in public settings, you know, and, uh, but it's something that's, something that's not manufactured, it's something unexpected, and it's something you just can't control, but then just give in to it because, Whatever God wants to do, He'll do with it to bless somebody. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Welcome. Christopher's question. Please provide some detail. The first sin by Lucifer and respect to desire the flesh. It seems that absolute good and evil in different levels existed. From the beginning. Um, all right. So, Christopher, can we uh, pick this question up on Wednesday? And uh, maybe I need you to explain it a little bit to me uh, so that I understand the question, especially what's in the brackets. But can we pick it up on Wednesday, please? Okay, so please remind me on Wednesday at the beginning of the class so we can start out with this question. And uh, maybe if you just explain it, then we can uh, respond to that. Okay. All right, uh, let's wrap up today. May I request somebody to please pray and then we will dismiss, please. Anyone could pray. Holy Lord, you, you are holy, King. You, you've called us to, to be a holy as you are holy, Lord. And we pray to that to you. Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you will empower us, Lord, to live the life that you called us to live, Lord. The life that you desire us as your children, Lord, mm -hmm. to live, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. 
cover us with your power and your glory, Lord. Let us manifest your glory, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, as, as our days continue on, on this planet, Lord. Mm -hmm. Let us be that work and that light, Lord. You say that we are light of, and salt of the earth, Lord. Let us be mm -hmm. that salt. Let us be that light, Lord. Let us shine, Lord. Let us show people that we are called by your name, Lord, and we are called by you, Jesus. Be with us at we meet together on Wednesday. In your mighty name, Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Hey man, thank you everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless.